I use Docker for everything, from setting up a local dev environment to running one-off commands, experimenting with new languages or frameworks, deploying multiple applications to the same server, and a lot more. Now you can do all of that without Docker, but it makes it just so much easier. Before I show you, let me talk about what Docker is and how it works. If you don't care about this or already know, feel free to skip ahead. The whole purpose of Docker is to utilize something called containerization. This basically means that you can take your code or your application and package it up in a way that has all of the software it requires ready to go inside of a single package. So this way you can deploy it to a server, share it to someone else's computer, and they don't need to have the specific software installed in order to run your application. It's all bundled up into a container with all of the software available at runtime using something called a Docker image. See before, if we wanted to have this kind of prepackaged software without having to have your system have the requirements for your software installed on it already, something that was common was to use a VM or virtual machine. This would basically mimic an entire operating system on whatever host computer you're running this on. The problem with that is it took up a massive amount of space. You'd have to set aside space for the entire operating system as well as the resources necessary to run it. All that meant you could only have a fairly small amount of VMs running on a particular machine before you started running out of resources. But with Docker, that's not the case. You could have dozens of these containers running on a single machine without hitting a resource limit. So what's the difference? So unlike a VM where you have a whole new operating system running on top of whatever your host machine's operating system is, the Docker image under the hood uses the host system's kernel and operating system files without directly interacting with them. So it can pull from your local machine and provide the bits necessary to spin up a full image or full like operating system without having to duplicate and include all the files necessary to run it. So I can have a full Linux operating system run in a Docker image, but under the hood, a lot of those pieces are coming from my host machine. It's all running in isolation though, so there's very little risk of any kind of corruption or damage happening to the underlying host. Speaking of images, there are a ton of pre-built images on something called the Docker Hub, a central repository of container images that you can explore. And anything in here is available to any Docker client. To use one, you use docker run and then provide the image name and tag. If you don't use a tag, it'll assume that you want whatever's at latest. So I can run docker run Ubuntu and it will download the image, create a container and run the default command inside that image, which for this is nothing. But anything you add in after this will be the command passed in to the underlying image. There are some exceptions to that rule with the difference between an entry point and a command, but I can cover that in a later video. So I can use docker run ubuntu lsl and see all the files in that image or docker run ubuntu who am I and see that this is running from a root user. You can even open up an interactive session using dash it. And if I run bin bash, I get this full interactive prompt. Now you can play around with this container and do whatever you want. For instance here, I'm just installing and using vim just to show that you have full access to things like the package management system, OS file system, and pretty much anything else you'd use in a VPS or VM. The container acts basically like a full operating system so long as it's running, because right now we don't have any kind of persistence of data in it. And whenever you exit it, it's destroyed. If there is an application or a terminal command that you want to run, but don't necessarily want to install it on your computer, chances are there's a Docker image for that. I use these kind of one-off containers to run specific CLI commands without having to worry about system dependencies or keep up with software updates. Like using ffmpeg to convert this file. I can find a Docker image from the hub specifically for it and run it in my terminal, just making sure that I bind my current directory where it expects input files to be. And there we go. Python is something that I use Docker with on a regular basis, and it's because, well, I hate dealing with it locally. Virtual environments, path issues, it's always just been a mess for me. So if I have a Python code base, I can use Docker and spin up a local container that's completely isolated from my computer. And as long as I include my code base inside the image and expose a port to the service that's running, I have a dev environment for my Python code without having to install or configure anything locally. I've also been using Docker recently to isolate my computer from AI tools like Claude Code or Cursor's Agents. There's been a few viral posts about these kind of going haywire and running commands they shouldn't have or messing with files outside of the scope of a particular project. So instead I can use, for instance, Claude Code 
through a container built off of Node.js. Then if I just provide it only my app's source code through a volume mount, any commands that it runs that might do something outside of the code base won't actually affect the underlying host, which is my computer, at all. And anything problematic, I can just roll back with Git and start over again. Most environments, though, need more than one container, for instance, a web server or a database. For that, we can use a Docker Compose YAML file and add in multiple containers together along with their configurations. So I have this PHP project that also has both a MariaDB database and a Redis instance attached to it. Now in my project for the host name of these services, I can just use the service names and my app will automatically connect to those as long as they're in the same Docker Compose file. I can also access them individually outside of my application since they're all port bound to my host computer as well. The nice thing about these is that they're separated by directory. So I can have a Docker Compose file in each one of my projects And as long as the ports attached to my host computer don't conflict, they can all be ran simultaneously. The images for each of these can then be tailored to specific requirements of these applications. Like let's say I have this old legacy application that I'm working on, and it is stuck on PHP 7.4. I can't upgrade right now. Instead of having to install something on my local environment to switch the PHP version, or God forbid having to manually do that myself, I can just update the tag on this project to use PHP 7.4. And even though these other ones are on the latest version, this dude stuck in the past right where I want it. Let's shift gears away from local environments for a bit and talk about production deployments. I host a lot of my projects in production using Docker, mostly because it makes it really easy to run multiple projects on a single small server. Most of my side projects barely hit like 10, 15% of CPU or memory usage for the cheapest VPS, so I can just stack them up and run multiple simultaneously and save a good amount of money. So let's see how that looks. Just like on my local computer, I can run one-off container images and bind them to a specific port on this server. And they'll be available to internet traffic. And on this VPS, I have two gigabytes of RAM. I can actually limit each of the containers that I'm running to only use 512 megabytes maximum. With my three applications running on this server, I still have 512 megabytes of overflow for the rest of the system processes, and I can be sure that the containers themselves shouldn't be the cause for my server running out of memory. Now right now, we're running these under plain HTTP and have no way of securing this traffic. But we can fix that using something called traffic, which is a reverse proxy, basically acting as a gateway between internet traffic and these containers. It'll automatically provision SSL certificates with Let's Encrypt, and you can specify things like domain names and ports inside of each Docker Compose file, so you really don't need a separate configuration. So now we have these three applications running, completely separate domain names associated with each of them, and this traffic container knows where to send incoming requests based on what domain someone's trying to hit. All this can be automated in something like a GitHub workflow as part of your CI CD process. And if you want to see how that would work in a practical application, let me know in the comments and I'll put something together based on your suggestions. Docker isn't all sunshine and rainbows 100% of the time, but it's an invaluable tool that I've made an integral part of my development workflow over the years. If you haven't tried it yet, definitely give it a shot and tell me what you think.